Very pleased to be joined by Sir David of Smalley in the flesh at Mythicist Milwaukee Con number five, I believe. How are you feeling? Feels good. It feels good. It's been a lot of fun so far. It has. It's gone. We had uh, we had the tough task of opening up. It was the first panel. How how has the political <coughs> discourse divided the atheist community? Yeah. How do you think that went? <laughs> <laughs> um, it was fun. Uh, it, it went pretty well. I think that um, we've got, uh, of course, a lot of animosity in the crowd hmm. and I think like in the crowd yeah in the crowd I think there's way more animosity in the crowd than on stage I didn't you know what I didn't even notice that they, I, I just felt like I, they I, loved me so <laughs> well you were the moderator of it and I thought you did a good job of just basically ignoring the crowd and hmm. focusing on, on I'm a much more aggressive moderator than you are I did notice some shouting in the front row yeah, say, yeah I will tell those people to shut up right and you were very you know you're very respectful they're, they're beneath I, me <laughs> I can't <you're> <laughs> So for me, I, you know, especially when it comes to the questions, some of the people rambled a bit. And there's a guy down there. I think Sean is handling like the Q and A, the line. But as a moderator, I'm I'm going to be a lot more aggressive right. on the panel. I'm going to get to your question. Let's go because there are literally. I mean, there was a line all the way around to the back of the theater. Yeah, we got about five questions in the end. Didn't yeah, we? we got like, five, and there were probably thirty-five or forty people mm-hmm. lined up. It was insane. So there's, there's something to be said because I mean, people use that. It's a pet peeve of mine. People use that as a, an opportunity for a monologue. Yeah. And I, I, when I get to a mic and these people, and I want to ask a question, I yeah, want to right. hear them answer. But there were two or three times where they just said things into the microphones, yes. in their faces, which happens in every Q&A. Yeah. But, I mean, I think you did a great job. I mean, it was, um, you, you started off with, you know, levity and, and uh, brought some humor to it. And then, you know, um, you did a good job of sharing the stage. Because, uh, especially, you know, de- dealing with, like, a lot of conferences like this, you have special. You have a, a physicist, and you have a person who's a biologist, and, mm-hmm. and they're not people who are used to the spotlight. Yeah. Literally, everybody here has cameras on them or microphones recording them all the time, and they try to steal conversations. Yeah. So you have this precarious, t- this precarious task of managing people who are used to being chiefs in media. Yeah. yeah. As the moderator, you've got to be like, hold on a second to a person who literally has millions of views on a YouTube channel. Strong person. Let, let someone else talk instead of you, and they're like, what? So. You know, I haven't done my moderation yet, but I think I think you did a fair job of that. Thanks, man. That's nice to hear. Um, I think I think one of the flashpoints of that conversation, which which is a question I I've been wanting to ask when I when I announced I was moderating, was this whole left right divide thing. And in terms of allowing uh, allowing right wing voices into the conversation and conservatives to to speak their piece, because there's a lot of people in our circles who just see that as completely beyond the pale. I mean, like mm-hmm. right wing synonymous with. Uh, you know, just bad in general or evil, and I think it, it came up a little bit at one point where we was accused, or, or generally there was accusations made of defending right wing views, and I, I think there's a distinction there to be made between bringing somebody in uh, and hearing what they have to say, letting them have their say, and you know, going to bat for the views they hold. So I mean, I don't know, maybe you can talk about that. To me, it comes down to strategy. Right. How effective? Imagine how effective we could be. If we listened to conservative voices that we disagree with, and they say, no, there should be an early cutoff for abortion. There should be, um, maybe we need to look into this climate change myth. And they're saying things that we're going, we're Mm. cringing as liberals. We let them say that, and then we say, but where do you stand on the God issue? And if they say, well, I don't believe in God, well, then you're an atheist. And if we start there, and we address the other things that we disagree with on, but say, I will debate you on the abortion thing, I will debate you on climate change, I will debate you on the earth being flat, whatever your thing is, but when it comes to the God issue, can we petition our respective groups to say, let's keep a separation of church and state? Can we work together to avoid blasphemy laws? Imagine how much powerful we would be, just strategically, strictly strategically speaking, if if we can get people who disagree with us on other things to agree on this main point, that can be a snowball effect. Because many people in this community, this movement, know that that's the that's the core of a lot of these problems. Hmm. Why are they anti-choice? It's because of God. Yeah. Why why do they think the climate change is nonsense? It's because God gave us dominion over the earth. Why why doesn't a woman have a right to choose about her body? Well, because that's that's God's, that's a temple for God. They're, all of these things, the way women are treated, all these different things, they tend to start in religion. So if we can reach out to the conservatives 
have them agree that there is no God by listening to them, talking with them, debating with them, and take those, those atheist conservatives and not push them away, but welcome them and have respectful disagreement about the other things where we, where we don't see eye to eye. I think that's how we can continue to be effective. If we continue to divide ourselves, we're going to split ourselves into obscurity. We're not yeah. going to be effective anymore. Yeah, that came up on the panel. Didn't we? So, uh, you know, spread so thin as it is, no. it makes no logical sense to eat your own in that way. But I mean, uh, the way this um, conference is structured is it's fairly unique in the sense that it invites uh, not controversy, should I say, but contentious issues to play out on stage. And I don't see a lot of other conferences under the secular banner or the atheism banner particularly doing that. Now, I mean, are they going to have to adopt because these uh, these kind of um, uh, tactics or ways of forming a conference to stay relevant because I, I just get the feeling that the appetites change a little bit there's not a lot of interest in creations and debate uh, certainly from what I see people want to hear about politics now or uh, you know campus wars or uh, you know far, far left SJWism and, and feminism and things like that I'll say that there are a lot of people who come to my show will say some will say I've been listening for six years and others will go I just found you last month hmm I'm like, where have you been? Like, I, what is going on? There's, there are millions and millions of people out there who have these thoughts, and they creep up every day. So even though I started in the movement, which we addressed that as well, is there even a community, um, 12 years ago, yeah, and started my show about six and a half, maybe seven years ago. And so there are people who are just now finding out about who I am, and just now finding out about who you are. And they're going, you know, I was in church last month, and I thought, maybe, th- maybe this is bullshit. Mm. And so they look up atheist YouTube or atheist podcast, and then because you know they can't read a book in front of their family because it's got the, the cover on it, yeah. so they have to go put something secret in my earbuds and just listen to it. And so they're they're finding us, and they're shocked sometimes to hear me go, "Yeah, there's a, a debate about God." And coming up next, a social justice warrior called me a Nazi, and we're going to talk to him. And they're like, "What?" <laughs> they don't understand the connection. Yeah. They don't see why we need to deal with that. I'm telling you, Stephen. I called my show Dogma Debate for a reason. I wanted it to be bigger than atheism. That's clever. I wanted to be able... I, I, had, the, I had the forethought a long time ago to, to go... The, the foresight a long time ago to say... There are dogmas outside of religion. Hmm. You can be a dogmatic Republican. You can be a dogmatic you know, Democrat or, or atheist or whatever. If you're dogmatic in your views, unwilling to budge despite evidence, that's a problem. And that's what I'm attacking. The issue is when folks who agree with me on 97% of my things, when I find that small dogma that they have, they don't want to hear me point it out. Do you think people are more angry than than we've seen traditionally in the last 5-10 years? I mean, I've, and Jacqueline Glenn on the panel, she made a point that she ran into some quite face-to-face aggressive behavior when she went to I think, the American Atheist Conference, mm-hmm. people confronting her. And I'm just wondering, we, we see a lot of that vitriol online, and you usually think it's just contained to the keyboard warriors, but it seems to be spilling out into into the public arena now. And has, the, has the climate changed in that sense? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'm seeing more and more people who used to advocate for tolerance of differing views and diversity of thought mm. now condemn that. I was met with that today after our panel. Right. I don't want to say who, I'm not going to get into that right now, but I will say that I was confronted by someone who was very angry, uh, trembling even, just very, very upset by something I said, and I had no idea that I had triggered someone like that. I had no clue. Um, And it, it took a minute for it to set in as to what even happened, and then I realized that the person had actually stormed out halfway through my comment because they were so offended. Right. And when I started to say, but I cleared this up already. I said this other part that you wanted me to say. And the person was then like, well, I didn't hear that. I stormed out. And so I, we had to have a, a private meeting about it and discuss it. And so uh, that may be coming up on other things that I do. I don't, I don't know if I can talk about it right now. But, well, there's but something I, I was confronted with something just even after the very first panel at MythCon. There's something interesting there more generally than I suppose that we can apply uh, uh, and talk about. And is there... Are there any views or opinions that you could hear somebody espousing that would make you physically tremble or make you want to leave a room? Do you think, do you think there is any button that can be touched uh, verbally that would cause you to have that kind of reaction? You know, I'm in a little bit of a unique position because of what I do for a living. Yeah. Um, I hear vitriolic, disgusting things on the regular. Hmm. Um, Sorry pe- about that. People have said, uh, it's not, a, I mean, I put myself in this situation. I yeah. mean, I, people have said across from me in my own studio, 
and said things to me like, I wish it were legal for me to take your child because you being an atheist are putting her in danger of going to hell. Wow. And I wish it were legal for me to say, on the bounds of him having no faith and morality, I should be able to take his kid and raise her in a good Christian household. That's, that's, you want to reach across the table and choke somebody yeah. when you say that. It's very, it's it's very personal. angry. Yeah, it's very personal. Um, so I, I, I take that anger and then I just go, how productive would it be if I lash out? Hmm. What's this going to do for us? I mean, I know from just having sat on that panel with you, there was nothing you said that was a big claim or controversial. You was espousing your opinions very objectively as far as I can see. I'll be very interested to dig into that when we, when we get some more information to find out what it was all about. But I mean, these tactics now, I mean, you mentioned family there. I find that a lot of people are worried about saying what they think or developing a profile because then people come for the family, people come for the occupation, people get in yeah. touch with where you work. And a lot of times it's a second family. Yes, so you're being welcomed into a second family after being rejected from your church community or even your own family yeah. for not believing. So we, we, we put a lot of value into that community aspect of it. Yeah, I just feel like it's getting a bit a bit more vicious in terms of the, the pushback. I mean, we just had there's a, a fairly unpopular politician in the UK at the moment, and a, a very well, sort of prominent left wing activist confronted him while he had his children with him. Uh, and film this and basically he was telling the children your dad's a horrible man do you know this about your dad has he told you he's a horrible man oh my and goodness I mean what, what's interesting about that is I mean that's that's beyond the pale as far as I'm concerned but what that did is that united um, all political viewpoints in sympathy with this one politician now so he's done more I mean that's that's a fairly unforgivable tactic but he's done more to unite people on the side of this politician than, than he could have done himself so I uh, just wonder if, you, if it, there's a little bit of um with all this going on now, do you think it, it's having an influence on people where they're thinking, you know what, I just I can't be bothered anymore. I'm just going to keep quiet, play it safe. Yeah, I think you're. the more we speak out and then people get demonized or attacked for having a differing opinion, you're not changing minds. You're just making people be quiet. It's a bit like being an abusive parent. Yeah. Your kid's not going to suddenly start loving and respecting you because you hit them more. They're just going to stop telling you when they disagree with you. They're going to they're gonna revert back and, and become a recluse and go, I hate that person and I don't get to be free to speak my mind. There's no growth there. There's no progress. We, people become afraid to say things in public. And all you're doing is you're, you're silencing the majority because nobody wants to get attacked. So you're, I have a job or I have, I'm going to that luncheon next week and I know she's going to be there so I'm not going to say anything to her comment and I'm not going to like his even though I agree with it because she's terrible. They just don't. And so the extreme, ridiculous voices become the spokespeople That's true. of sides that the vast majority of us don't even hold to. How often do you get this? This is something I get quite a lot, where someone will contact me privately and say, I really agree with what you say on this. All the time. But I can't share it because of A, B, and C. All the time. Yeah, that's really interesting. And it used to be about religion. Yeah. And it's not that anymore. Well, we've got the new religions, haven't we? That's we, the thing. Yeah. 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 It thing. used to be about Christianity, and now it's much more about... Uh, I, I'm sorry that this happened to you politically, or I'm sorry you got attacked. I'm, I'm glad you said what you said, mm. um, but I can't say anything publicly. So who's creating this climate then where we, we're in a position, especially in the land of the free, USA, USA, where people can't say what they say, what they think? I mean, who's creating this ground where people who have opinions that don't fit with the mainstream are actually reluctant to put their hand up for real world, you know, sincere consequences? People who find it virtuous to weaponize shame. That's a good answer. Yeah. If I can weaponize shame and silence you, I think I've won. Yeah. But just because you've crawled underground doesn't mean you're not fighting. That's good. So if, if you're an American right now and you're, you're thinking about becoming an activist in atheism or secularism or skepticism, what are the big issues that should be on their, their agenda? There's only one. It's separation of church and state. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's a science. right in the Constitution. So what, in what ways is some religion encroaching on the, uh, the Constitution now? Um, in 13 states right now, it is, or maybe it's 17, I'd have to check my numbers, it is not required by law for sex education to be medically accurate. They can literally go in and say, the daddy puts his hoo-hoo in the mama's ha-ha and babies are born. Like, they don't have to say, like, to freshmen in high school. Like, it's not required for it to be medically accurate. They still teach abstinence-only sex education, despite the fact that scientifically, in areas where abstinence-only sex education is taught, hmm. STDs are rampant, uh, teen pregnancy is rampant, and where medically accurate sex education is given, those things both drop. 
You can see it across the board. Will our government look at the statistics and go, it's scientifically better and statistically provable. We can demonstrate that it's better to teach medically accurate sex education. Sure, I personally have been in U.S. Congress lobbying them to make this, to make this change. Mm. And you know what I was told? Uh, by one of the representatives, one of the conservative representatives that I, that I, that I lobbied, um, she was uh, an assistant for him, and she said, she read all of my paperwork that I brought, and she said, I know he agrees with 100% of this. And she said, but he'll never support it. Because if he's the first Republican to jump on something that feels liberal, he'll be ousted by his friends. Hmm. He'll lose his clout within the Republicans. So it's very much a team sport. They don't give a damn about us. It's about keeping their jobs, keeping their clout, and keeping their power. It's a popularity contest, isn't it? In a Absolutely. Sense. And, uh, I think that's one of the reasons I, I could never consider politics. I think you have to, you become compromised almost immediately because you're trying to win votes. Your job. Than, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, we, Donald Trump came up, as he always does, uh, on our panel today, and I, I think that's a sort of a flashpoint in terms of where this discussion got a little bit angry and very, you know, I think what happened is, uh, me included, uh, in terms of nobody thought, uh, you'd, you'd imagine nobody thought from the discourse that he was ever going to get into the White House. Well, and then, he thought that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then, then we, you know, turn on the news the next day and he's just the President of the United States, and a lot of people were so convinced that they were right on this. Uh, that he'd never get in and he shouldn't get in because of who he is and then when the reality doesn't conform to their deepest convictions I think they lose their mind a little bit and I think we've seen it I think there is something in that Trump derangement syndrome that people are talking about I mean these are, you, you, the list is endless of that man's flaws and faults but I think there's a, a certain level of crazy that shouts the loudest that detracts from the real issues Well there was someone who, was, who recently shot themselves in the arm I think to protest Trump. I think it was a professor somewhere wow. who literally shot himself in the arm to protest Trump. Yeah. Should have gone for the thought. It would have been more apt. That's what I said when I heard it. Like <laughs> I'm glad our, our humor is, is similar. I said the same thing. I was like, he missed his foot. <laughs> he got him, got himself in the arm. Um, you know, I'm a I'm a big critic of Trump. Hmm. I really am. Uh, I heard somebody at, at this conference say they made a joke about the person who shot himself in the arm and said, I wish. Everybody who hates Trump would do that. And I said, I don't like Trump, like right in the circle. And like I spoke up and said, I don't. You know why? Because I feel safe to disagree here. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? And yeah. then we had a discussion about, and he immediately went, no, 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 I'm sorry, not everyone, not everyone. I apologized. I said, I didn't mean everyone. I'm saying the people who would go as far to do something so ridiculous and have this derangement. And I go, well, okay, but that's not what you said. Yeah. And we had to back it down and we had a reasonable conversation. But... Um, I'm certainly, you know, a big critic of, of Trump and, and most of the right uh, politically, but I can tell you that, you know, f I would go as far as, say, three years ago, maybe even up to two years ago, as recently as two years ago, I uh, felt more comfortable having atheists on and more threatened having pastors or fundamentalist Christians on. And now the opposite's true. That's really interesting. Right now in this moment, um, you and I have a good relationship. Yeah. You know, we've I've been on, you've been on my sh I've been on your show, and we have you ever been on my show? You know what? I don't did I bring so. you on? I don't think we. Did. The only time we talked was on your show. Yes, that's right. I yeah. definitely need to return that. We'll do that and get you one listener to your <laughs> podcast. Um, but uh, I know you, but for the most part, if whenever a, a fellow liberal asked me to do an interview or come on their show I expect it to be hostile mm -hmm. because many of those folks don't realize they're in a new religion yeah and when I just say that they stop listening to me they shut down because they have the dogma and I try to explain the way they're behaving the way they're attacking people and the very and I said on stage today that temper tantrums are not activism that's true. And people are missing out on that. Neither are tweets. So the amount of times I will see activists in someone's Twitter bio, and that's that's basically what it boils down to. They mm -hmm. just send tweets or attack people online. Uh, last question, then I think I'll ask you is on okay. since, since we're on Trump. Um, I think his critics need to realise that the tactics aren't working. The scandal's not affecting. The, you know, a new story each day. Trump said something horrible. Trump's done something horrible. It seems having, bulletproof. It's yeah, there's no effects whatsoever. So I mean, there's a change of tactics required if it, you know, if the right idea is to get Donald Trump out of office. So what, what do you think would do it? I mean, I, I don't. This this whole impeachment thing doesn't seem to be moving anywhere either. I don't know that I want him out of office. Yeah. And before everyone hates me for that. 
I think Pence is more dangerous. Right. Because I believe he's more competent. There's less of two evils in your mind. Yeah, I think... I think Trump's weakness is his own stupidity. <laughs> and if we can keep him in charge long enough to, to get more reasonable people in charge, I think that's our best bet. If we get rid of him and Pence takes over, now we have a more competent person who shares just as disgusting beliefs, and now we've got a real fight on our hands in 2020. Yeah. And I, I'm, that worries me. I think whoever you put up, just look at it this way, whoever you put up on the left, do you think they have a better chance of beating Trump or beating Pence? I, say, I mean, this, is all, this entire thing is exacerbate, exacerbated by the fact that we've got very weak leftist candidates as well. Uh, I think they, they kind of make it easier. So, uh, I, heard, then again, I heard a rumor. Go on. And I'm going to spread a rumor because that's what... You're with the National Enquirer, right? Right. Yes, yeah, sure. okay. Um, I heard a rumor that Biden is considering running right. with Obama as his VP. Is that a, a ex-president allowed to serve as vice president? Yes. I did not know this. Because he can't be elected to president. He wouldn't be. If Biden dies or for whatever so reason he can't straight, serve, right. he would be president again, but he wouldn't be, he wouldn't be elected president. This is some green wing shit. Yep. This is, yeah, and, and, and I know that because back when Hillary was deciding on a, on a running mate, the question came up, could Bill Clinton be her running mate? And the yeah. answer was yes. Fascinating. American politics, it's like, it, right. it, you know, for its lunacy, it's always entertaining as well. <laughs> I bet it is. But David, I've really enjoyed speaking to you. It's great spending the morning with you on, on the panel as well. Uh, is there anything else you want to say before I let you No, that's today? it. Yep. Thanks, buddy. No Appreciate it. Well,